All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, depending on where you are joining from in the world. Welcome to today's Ag Sector Council webinar titled SPS Priorities for Sub-Saharan Africa, Opportunities for Expanding Regional Trade and Improving Food Safety Systems. Trade, food safety, and the policy enabling environment are essential contributors to global food security, so we are very excited to be having this webinar discussion today. We have three speakers from ACDI, VOCA, and the LEO Project who will be uh, covering a lot of material, so I won't be too long here at the beginning. I'll, I'll just go over a few housekeeping issues. First, I wanted to let you all know that this webinar is hosted by AgriLinks, Feed the Future's technical knowledge sharing platform. AgriLinks hosts regular seminars and special events to facilitate the exchange of knowledge among practitioners. And you can visit agrilinks.org where you can contribute to online discussions, submit resources, and post to the blog. Of course, I should introduce myself. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I will be your uh, main facilitator today. To let you know, uh, you should use the chat box on your screen, which many of you have already done, to connect with other participants, share resources, and ask questions throughout the event. We'll be pulling your questions, noting them down, and asking as many as we can during the Q&A session, which will follow on the presentations after the speakers. If you have any technical issues at any time, if you think you're having audio issues or something's seizing up in, in your webinar experience, uh, please try starting a private chat with our AV tech, who's up there in the, the host section of the attendees pod. Uh, you can hover over AV tech uh, and click Start Private Chat. You can also start private chats with anyone else who's uh, joining the webinar today. Uh, so we certainly encourage making those connections. Lastly, this event is being recorded, and you will receive an email with the recording and other post-event resources uh, shortly after this event. And that will include the new reports that will be re referenced in this webinar. So uh, anything you aren't able to download today, you will definitely get an email uh, with those reports uh, in a, a short period of time. We hope about a week, but we'll see how quickly we can get all of that out to you. All right, so with that, uh, we're going to dive into an introduction. And, uh, and get started with our content today. So I would like to go ahead and introduce Jeff Hill, who is the Director for Policy uh, with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And he'll be giving a brief intro and introducing our speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to Jeff. Thank you, Julie. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I really want to actually also thank everybody for joining us on this, um, on this webinar. Uh, we, it, have a lot of people from all over the world and uh, really are looking forward to a great discussion here. So we're going to dig into this issue of SPS. What is SPS? The sanitary and phytosanitary systems, you know, that are, you know, really playing a critical role in trade, health, um, and productivity issues in, in agriculture. You know, for a long time, the SPS issues, you know, have been out there. But unpacking this and really understanding what are the problems that exist around this, what are the opportunities for being able to fix this, why should we care about this, has actually been uh, an important set of questions that um, we have felt really need to be, you know, dealt with more, you know, effectively. And I wanted to actually just put in perspective, you know how this fits within some of our thinking here within USAID and within uh, Feed the Future. It is, you know, this is actually an important part of, you know, the FTF work is a focus on selected value chains, agricultural and food security value chains that, that are really important to both the economy and the nutrition and the health of, you know, um, people from across all of Africa and other parts of the world as well. And within that, you know, clearly being able to get the benefits from, you know, the uh, work on value chains, it is important for people to be able to trade, you know, the goods that they are producing. And it's important for people to be able to have, you know, healthy food, you know, that they can, um, that they are eating here. And so, so really looking at these issues of, of, of SPS and how important they are for the success of different value chains is an important concern. And those, those relate to both, you know, uh, policy issues and interventions, but also technical issues of being able to solve, you know, some of these, uh, some of these. So, so we really look forward to learning 
uh, you know, what the studies that have been completed now and uh, that have been uh, sponsored by uh, the Bureau for Food Security you know, in East Africa, West Africa, and Southern Africa. And you know, in East Africa, the studies have you know, helped to look at uh, both the maize and livestock value chains across a number of countries, within countries, but also you know, across the different countries. In Southern Africa, it's looked at maize and soya and groundnut, both again across a number of countries and, and looking at also the issues of the uh, regional standards uh, that have uh, been established. And in West Africa, again, looking at you know, the maize and uh, livestock uh, value chains. So this gives us a chance to look across these areas and see what is different, what is similar, you know, what is working, what isn't working, what's the impact you know, that we are seeing from uh, you know, the, um, uh, the status of SPS efforts right now. And you know, I'm, we're really delighted that, in fact, we've got you know, three great presenters you know, that are going to actually uh, help us understand you know, the findings of what has come from these three different studies in East, West, and Southern Africa. And uh, so we have with us um, you know, today uh, Daniel Plunknett, who is um, you know, a, uh, a regional, uh, has been involved with regional economic integration and dealing with a number of these issues for a number of years. Uh, so we also have with us uh, Sophie Walker, right, who is uh, currently the chief of party with the um, uh, the Aflastop program in uh, East Africa, and we have with us also Andy Cook. Um, this being a unique mechanism, these um, you know the uh, the webinar here, we're 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 having people join us, you know, from the speakers from around the world, right? And so that this is you know a, a great opportunity for us to be able to link people, you know, together from around the world and get this experience and uh, share that uh, here. So. We're looking forward to the presentations. We're looking forward you know, to the discussion that's going to follow as well. So uh, let me just hand it over now you know, to Sophie Walker. Sophie? Thank you very much, Jeff, for the introduction. I appreciate it, and the introduction of my colleagues. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we're, produce, we're, we're reporting on three different regions, um, East, West, and Southern Africa. Um, we're covering the value chains of maize, livestock, and a couple of additional areas. Um, and we will talk um, in our presentation today in three main sections. The first section will look at the regional trade and how that is um, working at the moment. The next section will look at the SPS constraints that are currently existing in the regions that we're looking at. And finally, we're going to present some investments that we believe um, will help move the SPS agenda forward. I first got involved in the SPS agenda back in 2004 in aflatoxin when Kenya had just had the outbreak with 125 people dying. And I got involved in policy meetings and at the private sector. And when CDC put out a number of samples on the table and we all chose which ones would we destroy and which ones we would eat, we were horrified when the best quality looking maize had something in the region of 8,000 parts per billion in it. Maize is the key trading commodity in all of the regions that we're talking about. And much of USAID's investment looks at increasing productivity in maize. The maize moves from the rural areas into the urban markets. If the urban market happens to be across a border and is closer, it will move across the border, formally or informally. If the, 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 maize, the maize moves wherever there is demand. So you have the deficit areas driving the movement of maize. Those are primarily the urban areas. And in West Africa, that mainly moves the maize down from upcountry down into the coastal areas. In East Africa, we have Kenya that's sitting on a structural deficit of 300 to 500,000 tons. Uganda next door has a surplus. Not only that, Uganda's production comes off their fields around about eight weeks earlier than the Kenyan. And so it moves in because there is no maize currently in the Kenyan market. Zambia is another surplus producing country alongside with South Africa. And they're feeding into their neighbors of Zimbabwe, sometimes into Malawi, sometimes into DRC. The maize moves fluidly around the region, relatively fluidly, um, around the region based on the deficit markets. 
At the same time, we have maize seed. Maize seed in eastern and southern Africa is primarily managed by large commercial interests, though in Kenya that commercial interest is mainly the government. It produces high-quality hybrid seeds, which is sold both into the local markets, but also moves across the borders. The maize seed is adapted to the quality in the area uh, that they're working on. Sorry, excuse me. I couldn't move the slide forward. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everyone. I got distracted because I couldn't move my slides forward. The, the maize seed um, is moving across borders also into the neighboring countries because the climatic conditions are similar. West Africa has a much poorer seed development, and their seed markets are not nearly so well developed. And Andy's now going to cover you in the next slide um, about some of the issues there. Um, I'm going to talk about ruminants um, in West Africa and East Africa, which were covered in the studies that we've done. In addition to Sorry. domestic Sorry. value chains, West, West Africa has a long-standing and dynamic trade in cattle, sheep, and less so goats. From the arid and semi-arid Sahelian countries to the humid and subhumid coastal countries. West African herd owners trek animals to collection markets with traders then mostly trucking them within the country to an export market and then to the coastal country destination market. Slaughter takes place near the point of consumption Almost no red meat crosses land borders. In practice, little veterinary intervention along the value chain makes much difference to animal health. For decades, slaughter in the Sahel, followed by trucking red meat to the West African coast has been the holy grail, but it has never worked sustainably. Small quantities of meat are irregularly flown from Sahelian capitals to the West African coast and to Central Africa. Prospective Middle Eastern buyers sometimes visit Sahelian countries, but abattoir conditions have not been favorable, and so this, has, this value chain has not prospered. There is little ruminant trade between countries within East Africa, though considerable trade within each country to urban centers takes place. In contrast to West Africa, Animals move mostly on the hoof to their final destinations. Sudan, Ethiopia, and Somalia export live animals to the Middle East by sea. And uh, meat cuts and processed meats are produced and marketed in Ethiopia and particularly Kenya. I'm now going to hand over to Daniel, who will lead us into SPS systems and regional trade constraints. Thank you, Andy. Hello, everybody. Um, just to give you an idea about trade in ground nuts, uh, this was covered in the Southern Africa report. Uh, the bulk of trade in ground nuts is informal in nature and generally goes unrecorded in official statistics, although we can see uh, official data showing South Africa exporting about $4.5 million in ground nuts and peanut butter just to other SOTIC countries. Uh, Mozambique is at about uh, $1.5 million per year. 
these are in the official statistics, and we have uh, estimates that Malawi typically exports 50,000 to 100,000 tons of groundnuts per year just to the countries of the north, the RDC, Tanzania, Burundi, and Kenya. Uh, Zambia shows up as a steady exporter of peanut butter uh, within the region. Aflatoxin contamination is a major issue for groundnuts, uh, with recent testing showing that nearly half the crop in Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia tests above the EU limit of two parts per billion. And when the ministries of health have done uh, testing, the level of aflatoxin and peanut butter on store shelves is found to be many times the permitted threshold. And perhaps as a consequence of this, uh, nearly half the children in Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia in recent surveys are shown to suffer from stunting. Uh, generally, it is uh, South African importers in the formal sector who are the ones who require aflatoxin testing. Uh, many of them now test for aflatoxin in the countries of origin so that when the ground nuts arrive in South Africa, they know they are safe. Uh, two other value chains specific to uh, one region, uh, poultry in West Africa uh, is a sector that can be divided into extensive backyard chicken operations and more modern semi-intensive operations in competition with uh, imports uh, off the world market. Uh, within West Africa, there is cross-border trade in live birds and a vigorous trade in baby chicks, but there's little or no trade in poultry meat. Uh, these backyard poultry, known as poulet bicyclette uh, in West Africa, are generally not being fed much maize. So the issue of aflatoxin-contaminated feed for the chickens is not as pronounced in West Africa as perhaps elsewhere. Uh, interestingly, the backyard poultry is preferred by consumers as it's considered to have greater flavor. Uh, certainly a major SPS issue in recent years has been the uh, recurrence of avian influenza in West Africa in 2015. And uh, the SPS control systems for avian influenza are generally pretty effective despite the porous borders. The borders for poultry can be easily passed by, uh, whether at the formal border post or elsewhere. Uh, the lack of veterinary services for backyard poultry production is uh, um, not always very effective. And as for fo uh, excuse me, soy products in southern Africa, which our report covers, uh, we did not identify any real trade-related SPS issues. Um, it's interesting to note that South Africa produces GMO-derived soybeans, which can limit trade with the other southern African countries, such as Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia, which are less accepting of GMO products. Moving to our second section of the presentation this morning, um, SPS systems and regional trade constraints, um, we can uh, say that uh, SPS systems are really the domain of the national governments, which have the responsibility and the mandate to set their own SPS standards and regulatory structures. Our research has found that the standards are often in place for these food products, but there is insufficient enforcement and regulatory oversight. Um, the uh, problem of over overlapping competencies across the National Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, and the National Bureau of Standards when it comes to laboratory capabilities is a real problem. Coordination uh, really could be improved. Outside of South Africa, few labs are accredited. A regional approach through the regional economic communities has been attempted and could be reinforced, but to date has not been all that effective. The regional economic communities, the RECs, generally lack the mandate 
or excuse me, they have the mandate to develop common regional SPS standards, but have a lack of resources and a lack of executive authority, which means that mostly all the RECs can do is coordinate national SPS policies. One uh, example of successful collaboration at the regional level is through COMESA and SADC, and the, uh, they have developed seed harmonization regimes, which uh, we have uh, found that can facilitate trade. I think uh, above all, our main message is that uh, the SPS discussions at both the national and regional level would be more effective if the private sector were involved. Um, and now I'm going to pass along back to my, Kofi, my uh, colleague, Sophie. Thank you very much, Daniel. As I mentioned at the beginning, you can't see aflatoxin, you can't taste aflatoxin, and you can't smell aflatoxin. The picture that we have there of maize is what people traditionally think is an aflatoxin-contaminated maize plant. But it's not. It's probably fumonism looking at the green color that I can't actually tell. Aflatoxin is actually a thousand times more potent and more carcinogenic than fumonism. It is the key mycotoxin currently in Africa to be concerned about. And it's spread from Ethiopia all the way down into Mozambique. It's spread across West Africa. It's particularly prevalent in the lower-lying tropical areas that then have moisture problems at some of the times in the season. Most consumers are unaware that there is aflatoxin in their country. And yet, the LEO desk studies and looking at research paper proves that many of these countries are ex existing with problems of 20 to 30 percent of their commodities actually contaminated. That's both maize and groundnuts. Though some countries have no contamination, very little contamination in their maize, such as Zambia, but at the same time, it has high contamination of its groundnuts. There is limited testing both testing capacity and the capacity for the labs to have the budget. Government loves to have budget to actually carry out the tests, but also requirement for testing. Because although in some countries there might be a regulation on the book, such as 10 parts per billion in Kenya, it's not tested because if 20 or 30 percent of your maize is contaminated, that's three or 400,000 tons. You can't afford to destroy that amount of maize without creating a food insecurity problem. And so there's been a lack of policy enforcement, although there has been a movement towards regional standards for aflatoxin, particularly in East Africa, less so in South Africa, and less so in West Africa. Moving on to maize lethal necrosis, this is a, an SPS issue that um, suddenly leapt into our view in 2011 in Kenya. It is, has no implication to health, like aflatoxin does, but has significant implications to the maize plant health. It can cause up to 100% failure depending when the maize plant is exposed to these two viruses that act together. It's spread both through insects from field to field and through seed. And so it can spread rapidly and did into the neighboring countries, into Uganda and Rwanda, probably through seed sales, though that's not entirely unproven. We see in more southern Africa, the countries neighboring these contaminated areas, Tanzania is the latest country to be contaminated with the, with the disease, now setting up surveillance systems. So both Zambia and Malawi have limited surveillance, but they also have limited budget at moving the surveillance forward. We have seen, particularly in Kenya and Uganda and Rwanda, that the national SPS bodies coming together to respond to MLN and to put in action plans. But as I mentioned, South Africa has only a small awareness of it, and West Africa has almost no awareness of this issue. And that leads Andy in to talk again about the maize seed systems in West Africa. Thanks, Sophie. Um, we've heard that West Africa lags behind the rest of the continent in its awareness of MLN. More generally, West Africa is less concerned by quality of maize because of a history of cereal shortages. One person we talked to while doing field work for our study said simply, empty bellies don't worry about quality. 
West Africa's low maize productivity diminishes SPS concerns in the face of food security problems, and it also drives up poultry prices and constrains the development of that sector. Contrast this situation with, say, Kenya or Zambia, where seed markets are much more efficient. Until maize productivity increases and scarcity is reduced, the focus is more on quantity than quality. SPS issues are not the most important. Low maize productivity in West Africa is caused by inefficient national and regional seed markets. The regional maize seed market is composed of national markets that are segmented and protected. Here are the constraints. Firstly, at the national level, Agricultural research organizations may produce good breeder seed, but public sector bureaucracies are unable to get that seed to commercial multipliers and thus to the farmer. The farmer's access to improved seed from outside the country is also limited. It's limited by a lack of regional certification of seed so that buyers outside the country of origin can have confidence that the seed is of the advertised quality, and it's limited by a bias against improved seed from multinationals, leading to barriers to trade. I'm now going to talk about the SPS constraints to livestock. And what I say is true for West Africa and mostly true for East Africa uh, after some triangulation. I'd like to start by making a statement to which I will come back in a minute. Informality dominates and constrains the livestock value chains. Herd owners, extensive poultry farmers, traders, and butchers resist incurring extra costs to improve health because a lack of traceability of animals means that improved health is not rewarded. This is fundamental. Other constraints are, and they are numerous, seasonal weight losses which increase morbidity because feed markets do not compensate for the dry season shortage of pasture. Secondly, government vaccination campaigns against infectious diseases may be insufficient, not attaining the roughly 80% coverage needed for herd health. Veterinary medicines may be expensive because of delays in official approval of these medicines choking off competition or they may be imported illegally and so possibly be adulterated. Then, large areas of range have low ruminant densities and thus thin veterinary coverage, and civil insecurity further reduces that coverage. Laboratories for testing for disease are often poorly managed, deficient in equipment or consumables, or poorly linked to frontline service agents. Veterinary agents receive informal payments. You might call them bribes, though these are often at least partially to cover costs that the state does not pay. For example, motorbike expenses, and they are small in the overall scheme of things. More important is the lack of sanitary inspection that actually takes place 
due to a lack of equipment, a lack of motivation on the part of the veterinary agents, often due to low expectations, and a lack of means to deal with animals identified as diseased. At borders, poorly equipped veterinary agents often lack quarantine pens and procedures to deal with diseased animals. In East Africa, most trade ruminants cross borders without bothering to pass by veterinary posts. They're doing so on the hoof, so border disease checks are ineffective. In West Africa, most ruminants, uh, trade ruminants cross in trucks that pass by border posts, but in the background, large numbers of transhuman animals cross back and forth across border segments which are uncontrolled by veterinary agents. And then when we get to the bottom of the value chain, downstream, abattoirs are dilapidated, ill-equipped, and unhygienic because of inefficient public sector management and the influence of traditional butchers who cater to a mass market and have no formal training in veterinary science. Let us return to the lack of traceability of the animals. Supermarkets in the destination market have no way of knowing which traders have deliv delivered the cattle slaughtered to provide the beef they sell, never mind which mix of herders actually raised those animals. So the premium for quality that middle-class consumers will pay cannot be directed to herd donors who raise healthy animals. The animals are indistinguishable. If those animals could be distinguished, there would be a value chain constituency with an interest in raising sanitary standards in order to capture some of the consumer surplus that today remains entirely downstream in the value chain. So, there is little market segmentation along the value chain dividing the mass market from premium meat. There is almost no branding and there are no reputations for quality to protect. The sector is trapped in a low-level equilibrium. Now I'd like to make a few remarks about poultry, which we also covered in West Africa. Most farmed poultry is produced near urban consumers on a large scale. Large producers have a self-interest in preventing infectious diseases, but Aflatoxins from maize threaten the profitability of these farms because birds die or, at best, grow slowly. In contrast, the backyard poultry presents more of a trade problem. These birds receive few veterinary inputs and their production involves high morbidity and mortality and at least in West Africa, they participate in longer distance cross-border value chains where border crossing failures in terms of tracking the veterinary status of these birds are similar to those of ruminants. Daniel has mentioned avian flu, which is recurrent. In West Africa, there were outbreaks in 2006 and again in 2015. Despite bans linked to the declaration of avian influenza, informal traders continue to import some birds across porous borders. This is difficult to stop because avian influenza has little impact on human health. I'm now going to hand over again to Daniel, 
who will start outlining our recommended investment opportunities. Great. Thank you, Andy. A uh, lot of interesting ideas. Uh, we're moving into the third section of our presentation before the question and answer period. And we certainly invite you to submit questions, which you can do on the right-hand part of your screen. Part of our assignment in all three reports was to identify public and private sector investment opportunities. So not only U.S. Uh, donor bodies such as USAID or USDA or MCC, but also other bilateral or multilateral donors, and also the private sectors in these value chains in each country. And there are a lot of countries involved. Within each country, the multi-stakeholder dialogues that take place or that need to take place involve a lot of people and involve a lot of coordination. So one of our recommendations is an investment in coordination uh, to bring people from the different agencies and the different interest areas together at the national level, not just in the national capitals, but also in the local capitals within each country. And then to bring them together at the regional level, a lot of coordination involved. One of our main conclusions is that there is a great need to encourage greater private sector participation and investment in the SPS systems. We came up with uh, recommendations for all three regions in the reports, which should be available pretty soon on the same website uh, that you're logged into now. And um, there are... Uh, many recommendations at both the regional level and the national level uh, that could be taken up by the public or private sector. One of the intriguing ideas was to develop early warning systems or systems for risk monitoring for mycotoxins such as aflatoxin, maize lethal necrosis, MLN, and livestock diseases. And these systems, or a lot of other examples throughout the world, could bring together technology analysis based on better data with outreach to farmers, processors, and traders to let them know what to look for. How do you tell when MLN is in your field? How do you identify aflatoxin on ground nuts? Who do you take it to to get your maize uh, tested for aflatoxin? This gets at the need to raise awareness among people, actors throughout each value chain about these specific SPS issues. And in our reports, we try to offer market-oriented solutions to arrive at a safer food supply. Raising awareness means not just producers and farmers groups and millers and animal feed manufacturers, but also looking to involve consumers mother's groups interested or concerned about aflatoxin contamination, healthcare workers, an example, Mozambique hires ambulant doctors that go around in rural regions from house to house asking about nutrition, uh, household health, women's and children's health. Um, agricultural extension workers are another avenue. Most ministries of health uh, are able to access public service announcements through local community radio and national TV stations. There's now social media. Our reports suggest a number of ways to raise awareness. Uh, I'm going to pass along now to Sophie to talk about more specific investments uh, related to micro. Thank you very much, Daniel. Looking first to aflatoxin, I have to say it's a rather exciting time to be involved in it. Twelve years ago, there was very little on, available for the African governments or the, or the South American governments or the Asian governments to actually look at to see how they could address this problem um, that was affecting their populations. However, with uh, support in research and development, we now have a number of mitigations that will 
address it. AFRASAFE, supported by USAID and the Gates Foundation, will treat the soil. It produces an 80 to 95 percent reduction of actual occurrence of aflatoxin there. Hermetic storage will also reduce the increase of aflatoxin during storage, 95 percent. And these are now being commercialized into the market. The so IITA is moving AFRASAFE. It's registered in Kenya, Nigeria, and is in the process of registering in Senegal, Gambia. And they have plans to move that out over another nine countries in West, East, and Southern Africa over the next couple of years. The movement of hermetic storage is gaining speed, um, particularly through um, the AgResults program in Kenya, where we're now having all hundreds of thousands of sales of hermetic storage, not to deal with aflatoxin, but to deal with infestation, insects. But at the same time, it's also mitigating aflatoxin increases in storage. So it's an exciting time that there are now solutions. But as Daniel said, we need to now raise awareness. Now there is a solution. Now countries can address the aflatoxin aspect. We need to raise the awareness to everyone, to the consumers at the political level and the producers on how to address this issue. And that requires local champions. While the USAID's um, appointed regional SPS advisor in East Africa helps coordinate and link people together, it doesn't become personal until you, until you start talking about your children are being poisoned. And to make it personal, you want local people in the media, the politicians, talking about this as part of their agenda to actually move this into the public consciousness. And as it moves into public consciousness, then it allows support to the private sector incentives, very similar to the Agrizal program. For instance, you could create a private sector reward for all the, the volume of aflatoxin re regulated levels peanut butter in Malawi. And as you reward the private sector to change their systems to improve the quality of their peanut butters, simultaneously you can now start bringing in the regulatory side so that the government can now start imposing these safe regulations so that the food stuff that is being fed to our children and to our families is now safe. And this all feeds into each other. It becomes a self-supporting system. As the trade and the processors want clean food, so therefore the producers of the food have to deliver clean food, otherwise it won't sell into the market. Looking at maize leaf and macrosis, um, there has been great movement in East Africa to put together national action plans. And those national action plans are, act are active and being moved forward. There is the ability now to bring West Africa and Southern Africa into East Africa to see what's been done and what can be done, not just the maize lethal necrosis. Maize lethal necrosis is today's problem. In five years' time or ten years' time, there will be a new lethal plant disease that needs to be addressed. And if we've already worked out how to have national action plans, who should be involved, who needs this funding, these countries will be more able to rapidly respond to potential outbreaks in the future. We also need to bring in the private sector, particularly in Southern Africa and potentially in West Africa that develop. They need to understand why MLN might be important to them because, as some of the Kenyan seed companies say, they've closed down their seed production because they can't afford the loss when MLN is found on their land. And so that surveillance and the private sector support to surveillance is absolutely important as we move the investments forward. I'm now going to hand over to Andy, who's going to cover the West African investments in maize. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I made the point earlier that West Africa has particular uh, maize problems. And uh, this particular slide is to emphasize the need to help West Africa catch up on its maize productivity in order that it can begin to really focus as much as Eastern and Southern Africa uh, on the issue, the SPS issues, uh, which are the core theme uh, today. So there's a need to increase maize productivity in West Africa, a need to develop commercial seed markets. Nationally, in each country, by licensing of multiplication and distribution rights, of public domain seed to private firms, and regionally harmonizing national seed policies and through regional certification of seed 
produced nationally so that uh, seed traders and ultimately farmers in a given West African country can have some confidence that imported seed, seed imported from another West African country, will be what it says, will do what it says on the bag. And with improved maize seed and other inputs, the farmer can increase his production and focus his attention on SPS issues and quality. Let me now talk about livestock sector investment recommendations from our reports. Upstream on the value chain, livestock production systems need improvements in ruminant and poultry health by re-establishing, or in some cases establishing for the first time, para-vet systems under the supervision of licensed veterinarians, public or private. Para-veterinarians have basic training in veterinary medicine, a stock of the most important veterinary drugs, a link to more qualified veterinarians which allows them to, to get advice and to have the means of replenishing their drug stock, stocks. Downstream, facilitation of the creation of abattoirs targeting high-end markets is another recommendation. The components would be private management of slaughter operations and the cold chain and strict hygiene rules. Supports could take the form of cost share grants to upgrade facilities and obtain quality standards. This would allow the export of hygienic meat as well as the production of hygienic meat for domestic middle class consumers, particularly if the abattoir were linked, and this is important, to a shorter regional red meat value chain linking the producer and the abattoir with direct deals between peri-urban producers and supermarkets. Imagine producers clustered around Sahelian urban centers who already invest in improved crossbred animals and provide good veterinary care and supplementary feed to their animals. And this, these are the people who already exist and they will make great candidates for a source of quality red meat. And they would be linked through perhaps joint ventures with coastal and Sahelian participants, ensuring that there is a constituency to solve problems that may arise in both the producing country and the consuming country. It would be preferable to supplement the direct deals with traceability, which I've talked about before, so that there would be a way to follow the animal along the value chain from farm to fork, thus allowing feedback back up the value chain on hygiene lapses. There should also, if possible, be a, a development of irrigated fodder crops and a more integrated regional feed market to compensate for seasonal deficits of natural pasture and investment in exotic indigenous crossbreeds. These options can be combined into three models. Firstly, the first model is the transport of animals to coastal West Africa for slaughter, as currently happens, but with better abattoirs in coastal cities. And this is linked to what the West Africa Trade Hub is developing at the moment. A second model is slaughter in the Sahel for road and possibly air shipments to coastal West African cities. The third model is the development of that slaughter in the Sahel for air shipment to the Middle East, etc. So that, I think, is the, largely the end of our presentation. Um, I'm going to leave you with a slide which I 
don't propose to discuss that summarizes some of the major points that we have been making. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Sophie, Andy, and Daniel. Just making sure I get a thumbs up that my mic is working. Oh, good. Great. Um, well, thank you all who are participating in the chat box. We've had a lot of really interesting uh, questions, comments, and shared experiences uh, come in. So I certainly encourage anyone who hasn't scrolled through the chat box to take a look there. We've been collecting your questions, and we'll go ahead and start asking some of those to our presenters. Please continue to put your questions in the chat box. We have you know, up to uh, about 11 a.m. Eastern time uh, to answer questions, so we'll get through as many as we can in that amount of time. All right, first off, there were a number of questions that came in uh, during Sophie's portion of the presentation that focused on a few aspects of maize disease, some clarifications. So I thought I would go ahead and ask those first. Uh, Dirk Stryker asked, are the hybrid varieties of maize in East and Southern Africa more susceptible to disease than the land races of West Africa? Higher yields, but greater vulnerability. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Dirk. Um, absolutely truthfully, I, I'm not a plant breeder, and I'm not going to be able to answer this entirely fully. I can mention that the, there is very little difference in some of the hybrid varieties in East Africa and the local varieties in their um, susceptibility to aflatoxin. What we have seen is that the, the varieties that the cover of the maize cob is open at the end are more susceptible because more moisture gets in and there's more access for spores to sit on those ends, and that's where you get higher contamination levels. Um, Absolutely. Again, I don't know whether Andy has any better knowledge in this, but I don't think there's been a lot of research on the West African races versus the South African or the East African hybrids. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I'm not aware. This Great, is Andy. thank you. Yeah. And there were two questions that came in from Patrice Hakizamana, uh, who asked a, a couple of questions about maize lethal necrosis. One was, can you explain whether crop diseases like MLN in maize may cause uh, harvest losses, and, but not health hazards as mycotoxins such as aflatoxin, or do they also cause health hazards? And then also, how efficient will investments in MLN control be without resistant maize varieties available for farmers? Thank you for those well, questions, Patrice. Southern Africa. We looked at this question a little bit, and um, as far as is known, there aren't real health risks related to maize lethal necrosis, but there needs to be a lot more research. There's some concern that it might cause mycotoxins um, in the plant materials that are left. Uh, Sophie, do you... Sorry, thank you, Daniel. Um, two aspects. Um, the MLN is a plant disease. It kills the plant. It doesn't have residue that's left that will contaminate um, human food in any way that will affect the human consumption. And, and, and Daniel is right. If you leave the residue in the field, it's quite possible that the viruses that are, are propagating there then it's easier to spread to the next field than everything else. But there, there isn't an interaction with human health. For your mycotoxins, the funguses that grow as they grow and propagate, they deposit this toxin, and that's what's poisonous, and it's a byproduct of actual fungal growth, um, and it's just a toxin that's deposited and is contaminated. In terms of looking at the, um, the different varieties and looking for NLN um, resistant maize varieties, that is going on at the moment, but in any variety development, it takes years to look at the different um, maize strains to the plant breeding, process through, check that it's MLN um, resistant in controlled areas that doesn't actually allow that to spread, and then to look to see whether it has the right climatic conditions to grow in the areas where the disease does. And this disease is spreading over all climatic conditions in Eastern, in, in Eastern Africa. Um, and then finally, does it have sufficient yields to actually make it marketable on the market? So it, it's surveillance and control at the moment is the more viable solution. And Kenya and Uganda have been fairly effective at this point of finding it, destroying it, and, spreading, and preventing it from spreading too far. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Sophie. Um, as long as we're discussing maize and maize disease, a question just came in from Margaret McDaniel. One of Daniel's slides said that there is a regional standard for aflatoxin in East and Southern Africa. Uh, can you, Daniel, discuss this a little bit further, please? Uh, what are the regional standards uh, for what crop and for what end use? Uh, that's an excellent question, Margaret, and um, there is not a simple, easy answer for that. Uh, the regional standards are being organized through COMESA and SADC, the Southern African Development Community, uh, some of which have overlapping membership, of course. And um, what they have generally done, those uh, regional economic communities, in their SPS committees, on which each of the national governments is represented, uh, they have gone with the codex standard, which is uh, 10 parts per billion for maize. Um, there is a um, standard out there of 15 parts per billion for ground nuts as table nuts. Um, these standards are not binding regional standards. They're more guidelines that uh, the Comesa and Sadek countries are essentially affirming that Codex uh, provides, uh, which is uh, through, based at FAO in Rome and is recognized by the WTO, is the standard setting body or a standard setting body throughout the world, um, and that these standards um, are uh, acceptable. Uh, within each of those regional economic communities, but each national government retains sovereignty over their SPS rules and can impose a higher standard if they wish. So the regional standards are still at the national level. You bring up the interesting question, Margaret, about different uses. This would be one of the really good areas for helping the national governments and the two RECs or the RECs throughout Africa to delineate um, what the acceptable standards for aflatoxin are based on usage, whether it's for human consumption, whether it's for animal consumption, which type of animal. Uh, from the research that we have done uh, in our three regional reports, uh, the larger the animal, the less susceptible to aflatoxin they seem to be. Uh, the older the animal, the less susceptible. Um, dairy uh, and certainly breeding animals are considered amongst the most susceptible. So this is an area that really could be fleshed out. Uh, so Daniel, there was a question coming in from Frida Mobici, who works for the Soybean Innovation Lab in Mozambique, and who stated, on my last visit, I noted a a growing market for poultry byproducts, such as gizzard, liver, and heart, dominated primarily by women. Recognizing this as a cheap source of animal protein within the informal market, do you have any suggestions on how SPS can be addressed in low-end markets? Well, it really is nice to be uh, amongst a community of researchers who pose very uh, uh, probing and uh, interesting questions because um, this is an area that uh, certainly gets into product differentiation um, and many places around the world are very different than the U.S. which for poultry meat uh, prefers uh, you know, the white meat. Uh, the uh, organs, the offal uh, parts are very much prized elsewhere around the world um, and I think it's a, a positive sign if uh, the kidneys and livers and, and other uh, organ meats are being um, sold on a separate basis. Um, each of those has a separate SPS risk. Um, I'm wondering if uh, where Frida has uh, seen these being sold, whether or not the cold chain is being uh, guaranteed throughout the, uh, the process or even at the, the point of sale. There are a lot of sort of basic common sense things related to SPS and food safety that 
in the U.S. there's a great deal of information out there through the USDA and FDA about food safety techniques that consumers and certainly uh, marketers can use. Um, and I would say that it would be a combination of uh, how to improve the system would be uh, the uh, marketers and retailers and the cutters, the, the butchers of uh, these poultry, uh, understanding where the critical control points are. What we, you know, we talk about HACCP and what are the investments they can make to make their products safer and then to gain a reputation uh, for safer products and also for those private sector people to reach out to the government officials and say, am I meeting the standards? And, you know, what are your programs to help me and what can I do myself? So starting a dialogue about food safety uh, in these, uh, you know, um, uh, poultry parts markets. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Let's see. Uh, there was a question uh, I think I'll send over to Sophie about giving an update on the actual African countries currently affected by maize lethal necrosis. And that was from Seydou Samake. Thank you for the question, Seydou. Um, according to CIMIT's latest information, um, currently MLM is present in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. That's where it's known to be present. It, the surveillance has been going on in Malawi and Zambia. They were using um, tests, which only test for one virus, but on the grounds that if, only, if one virus is not present, then they can't have maize lethal necrosis. Those surveys that were done earlier this year showed no sign in northern Zambia and northern um, Malawi. So the emphasis is that that needs to be redone regularly each season that they have maize production to ensure that it isn't spreading further south. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to just test one more time and see if Andy's voice is coming through. Andy, if you're there, will you speak up? Yes, I'm, uh, yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Um, a couple of questions came in during your presentation uh, focused on livestock. And so I thought I would just fire off two of them quickly uh, from Dick Tinsley. How much of backyard poultry tends to be scrounge feed, and how long does it take to get marketable with some major tough meat problems? So it sounds like he's wondering you know, if, if feed affects meat quality, um, how does that ultimately affect marketing or food safety? And um, just also a curiosity about branding on cattle. Most cattle he's seen have massive brands on them, perhaps not coated, but definite scars. And you had mentioned no branding on cattle. so. Wondering if you could clarify a bit about that. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Dick. Um, the short answer about the diet of the backyard poultry is that I don't know. We didn't get into a lot of detail about this. Uh, I think the main point was that as far as we could find out, there was very little in the way of maize being consumed, and I think that Dan made this point. Uh, therefore, the um, the aflatoxin threat uh, to the, that part of the, that poultry value chain uh, was very limited. Um, in addition, uh, something which may go contrary to the, um, the assumption on which the question is based, uh, it, it seemed that there was a very positive preference uh, amongst many people in West Africa, uh, certainly under certain circumstances, and I'm thinking of being in restaurants, uh, for the albeit tough but um, tasty uh, uh, backyard chicken. Um, and I, I did not get any feedback suggesting that there was a problem with it. It was actually actively preferred under those conditions to, to the more, perhaps more succulent um, farmed chicken. Uh, so that would be my reaction to the first question. And then I've lost the second question, just a second. Um, oh, the branding. Um, I think uh, it's a confusion to do with uh, the two meanings of the word branding. I wasn't using branding in the sense of uh, branding cattle. I was using branding in the sense of branding perhaps the meat, the supermarket branding, 
uh, that would apply and so that uh, a supermarket would have an interest in defending the quality associated with its brand with respect to its consumers. And that would mean an interest in uh, up, uh, up the market chain what was happening uh, and knowing uh, through traceability where that stake was coming from. Uh, the means of traceability might involve branding in the other sense, um, but I haven't got into that, uh, I haven't thought that through in any great depth. Um, and I'm afraid that's all I have in the way of response to those two questions. That's great, Andy. Thank you. All right. A, a broader question uh, came in in response to the various slides that all of you shared about investments that can be made in SPS. Um, and this is a question uh, from Dirk Stryker again. It's easy to specify various recommendations for improving the situation, but where should priorities be placed? The problem is that successful implementation of these recommendations requires substantial changes in institutions, trade mechanisms, etc. Do you know of any testing on the viability of different approaches for using randomized or using randomized controlled trials on any of these recommendations? Or if not, do you have any comments on the priority level of certain investments? So this is something that everyone can weigh on when weigh in on. Um, let's see, is uh, Daniel, would you like to start on this one? Sure. Um, you know, Dirk Stryker is kind of the secret shopper, I think, because both Andy and I have a long relationship with him and um, appreciate the question. Um, I would say that they're really, uh, in terms of aid effectiveness or what under the British uh, Development Agency, DFID, they call uh, value for money, uh, I don't think there are a lot of uh, really, uh, uh, you know, good uh, ways to determine which are the best approaches. Um, in the recommendations that we're making, we try to have both large and small, both bite-sized, that perhaps a small bilateral uh, you know, donor agency might address, or you know, um, a, a foundation of some kind uh, would see an interest in, as well as larger scale ones. Um, and also having uh, recommended investments at both the national and the regional level. Um, what uh, is uh, being suggested is that, you know, it's very important to monitor the effectiveness of these different approaches and try to learn from them for the future uh, activities that uh, might be undertaken. If I can add to that, um this is Andy. I think that one thing that uh, the study in West Africa uh, didn't do is get a detailed understanding of what all the other donors are doing. And this may be partly repeating what Dan has just said. Um, I think within a coordination of other, with other donors, it would probably be transparent that uh, the other donors were covering quite a lot of these things, which would limit the options. Uh, they would still have a prioritization problem, but perhaps not such a big one. Um, I think it's also a question of short term against long term. Um, it would be nice, certainly, to make some uh, investments in improving regional and uh, national institutions so that if they become stronger, if, then the, um, some of the problems or the equivalent problems in five years' time uh, would be fewer and less severe. On the other hand, obviously, and maybe this is a bit simplistic, just but I'll say it nonetheless, uh, in the short run, if emergencies come up, they have to be dealt with so that people can be fed. Thank you. And one of the things that we had discussed, uh, just to chime back in, was that um, many of the most significant reforms in SPS systems occur due to food safety uh, incidents. Uh, if you will, scandals. Um, in South Africa 10, 12 years ago, it was found that the peanut butter being uh, given to the children in the school feeding program was well above the permitted level for aflatoxin. And this led to significant reform within South Africa's sector 
and as far as I know, they stopped serving uh, peanut butter uh, to the children. Um, if the peanut butter is safe now, maybe they can reconsider. Hi, thank you. Uh, sorry, Dirk, I just wanted to add um, something on the randomized trials. AFLASAFE has been extensively tested, um, firstly laboratory, then control trials, and then randomized trials on farms in various areas. Um, another randomized trial that happened recently um, was carried out by IFPRI in Kenya, where they looked at the effect of different post-harvest practices on aflatoxin increases three months later. So they had traditional uh, drying of maize, then they had it on plastic sheets, then they had it using um, the Easy Dry M500, and then they had um, a small trial with the hermetic bags. That showed that um, using plastic sheets, uh, impermeable plastic sheets, reduced the increase in aflatoxin by 26%. The dryer reduced the increase by 77%, and the um, hermetic bags reduced the increase by 95%. Um, so, yes, there have been randomized trials, and then looking at the economics of those different interventions is also included in some of the literature. Thank you. Um, when Sophie is talking about the hermetic bags, those are bags that were developed uh, as part of the cowpea or Nye Bay uh, protein crop sector for West Africa. Uh, they're called PIX bags or Purdue Improved Cowpea uh, Sacks. And they have the traditional jute bags with then two layers of plastic bags inside. And while this was found to be quite effective at uh, preventing weevils from getting into the cow peas or Nye Bay, um, I believe, Sophie, it's been shown that they're very helpful on maize and they're doing testing to see if these PIX bags will be helpful on ground nuts. Um. The, uh, it's not just PIX bags. Any hermetic bag um, will prevent aflatoxin increase. What you need to look at is its resistance for insect penetration from outside. The aspergillus simply goes dormant when it's in this low oxygen environment. When oxygen comes back in, the aspergillus then reactivates and starts growing. Um, they have been trying hermetic bags with groundnuts. It's not been as successful as it has been for the um, non-oil seed crops um, as yet, but they're still working on it. It has to be a lot drier. And I think one of the things I've certainly learned from you, Sophie, is that in storage, whether it's maize or ground nuts, the levels of aflatoxin often have the tendency to increase in storage when the crop is just piled on top of each other and care isn't taken to, um, you know, aerate it properly or to, you know, it's a complicated thing. Yes, aflatoxin does increase in storage and the concept that reducing the moisture to below 13.5% would stop aflatoxin increases works for some strains, but there are strains in Kenya that quite happily propagate at 13.5% moisture and less um, at 25 to 90% per month increases. Julie, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's great to have uh, some of this conversation back and forth between our presenters who are joining from uh, wildly different locations. It's exciting, and thank you for that, um, those responses. All right, we have about 13 minutes left uh, for Q&A, so we'll chug right through a few more. Um, there was, let's see. All right, one question came in from Indra Klein. Uh, about the cost of seed. How does the cost of seed affect the manner in which farmers can adequately grow and protect their crops? What strategies are being developed to facilitate farmers' ability to leverage these costs? Uh, this seems like a question for Andy. I'm not sure I have an answer to that. I'm still trying to find the question. Uh... Yes, it's the second one oh, in our right. Q&A box, uh, our, our private presenter Q&A box. I was Thank you. I don't think I have an answer to this one. I have to be honest. I'm sorry. I, this, is not, uh, this is outside my area of expertise. I can say, I can well, say I a good point. I could take a stab at it. Uh, 
So I, I think the cost of seed and whether farmers will adopt it is very dependent on how active the market is in terms of actual access to market. So if you look at the Kenyan market, um, particularly in the North Rift areas, we have moved from you know, fairly low levels to approximately 96% of the smallholder farmers up there now use hybrid seed because the yields are so significantly higher than the local varieties. If you move down into eastern Kenya, though, um, although almost every farmer still uses some hybrid seed, they tend to have up to five varieties on their fields. And this is because they're using strategies because the hybrid seed needs more water, but they could have a climatic problem with lack of rain, so they also plant what their local varieties that they think is more resistant to drought. As you move around, so Kenya is one of the more sophisticated seed, um, seed buying and seed you know, producing countries in the region. As you move out from there, um, you, you move down into northern Zambia. There's been low seed adoption, which is changing now. Again, as that market drives the security that you can sell your product, your ability to invest in knowing that you have a market at the end increases. And so your willingness to buy seed increases. Thank you. Yes, the, uh, the question of what type of seed does a farmer plant is a key economic question throughout Africa. Um, hybrid seeds are generally available, but whereas most African countries don't offer pre-harvest finance, uh, the farmers need to have the money to purchase the seeds. Um, and any programs that are designed to encourage them to adopt new seed varieties, improved varieties. You know, certainly the first year, if you give it to me, I'll plant it. And, um, you know, hopefully see that, you know, there's greater yield and less pest resistance. I think one of the conclusions from our research is that the improved and hybrid seeds uh, are generally more resistant to aflatoxin and fumonisin and other um, uh, plant diseases, and uh, there's research through CIMIT and IITA going on to try to develop MLN resistant varieties or identify which varieties. So the choice of seed in terms of the ultimate impact on SPS and food safety uh, is, a, is a key element. And I think most farmers do it by sense of touch with his or her uh, sense of which ones are going to be most profitable. And as Sophie said, you know, it's kind of a, a survival thing, uh, strategy of going to plant some of these that I paid for and then some that I saved from last year, the open pollinated varieties. Excellent. Thank you. And um, we have, recognizing that we only have about 10 minutes left, I think it's a good time to go and pull up a few of our ending polls. Uh, we'll hope you stick around for another 10 minutes, but recognizing that a few people might need to take off, uh, please go ahead and take these polls on your screen, which will help us shape and improve our future AgriLinks webinars. All right, a few more questions in our queue here. Um, there's one that I'll go ahead and direct to Sophie from Numeri, uh, which is, is groundnut seed treatment with some permissible chemicals an option to control aflatoxin prevalence? Thank you, Julie. Um, and, and Numeri, the IITA is currently trialing AfroSafe with groundnuts. Um, I know it's being trialed in Malawi to see whether it will be an effective um, mitigation method there. I know that there were trials with fungicides trying to treat the soil and the crops that were not particularly successful. So not a great, not, not a huge answer, but it's, it's on its way. And as long as uh, we're on you, Sophie, I think that um, you maybe answered this in the chat box, but it would be good to, to call it out since the question came up again, uh, which is a question from Randy Shackleford. Uh, a question regarding the use of M-Reader by Mobile Assay from Colorado uh, in countries other than Zambia for quicker, less expensive aflatoxin testing. He has used this testing method in villages without electricity and had results in approximately 15 minutes, which is 
Could you explain? Thank you very much, Randy, for that. Um, there's a, a new exciting development also from ICRASAT, uh, which has just been launched in Malawi, where they also have a portable field trial where the um, response is, I think, within 10 minutes and costs $2, $2 um, per test. The other countries that have used the mobile assay, I know Kenya has used it, and I'm pretty certain that Kenya has used it as well, but it hasn't become very popular yet. All right, and then um, a topic that always gets brought up in, I think, food safety and trade discussions is that of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, and Dirk had asked about uh, the speed of developing greater resistance to disease might be increased with recent advances in genomics. It's very important because the use of these varieties is likely to be more cost effective. But what resistance have you seen because of concern over GMOs. And why don't we send this one to Daniel? Uh, this was one of the things that we studied as part of the Southern Africa uh, SPS report. Um, and we have four target countries under the Feed the Future, uh, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and Zambia. South Africa, uh, it is, uh, there is a whole procedure for approval uh, for the planting of GMO crops uh, and the marketing of them. And um, that is, I would say, the predominant uh, type of uh, seed used uh, in the soy sector and uh, in part for the maize sector as well. Interestingly, the other three countries, uh, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia, each to varying degrees, uh, is less accepting or not accepting at all of GMOs. Um, and uh, we were able to do some uh, preliminary analysis or, you know, on the, given the time permitting, about uh, that GMO acceptance. Um, you know, this is a question certainly in both East Africa and West Africa. And, you know, Sophie, Andy, do you guys have perspective on the GMOs? No, it didn't come up in our study, although we weren't asking specifically about it. In East Africa, there is still significant resistance to GMOs, and it's, it's not an area that while I think Kenya has just recently um, started GMO trials, there are still huge feelings against it, even though they're not necessarily um, useful in terms of productivity. Thank you. And even in South Africa, the market that has, you know, been more accepting of it, there are certainly in uh, consumer retail outlets uh, products that say produced without GMOs. And so those products attain a certain cachet and are perhaps able to command a price premium for not being GMO derived. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I think I'll go ahead and take the facilitator's prerogative to ask one last question uh, for our webinar today. And that is a question that I'll direct to Andy, which is, are the SPS standards for livestock realistic? Should standards fall at the highest level of codex, or should we be trying to hit uh, lower quality markets first? Is, is there a, you know, a standard for how we address these standards? or a recommendation going forward? I don't think we've got to that stage yet, Julie. Um, West Africa, where I was doing the field work, um, has got a situation where the two regional economic communities, ECOWAS and UEMWA, each have um, a set of regulations about SPS, but they've not been able to enforce them. Uh, so that you've got diversity across countries, and then you've got the problem when the national, the, the countries uh, put, uh, promulgate whatever laws they are going to um, implement, they propose to implement, which may not be the same as the regional norms, the, uh, then there is a difference between that implement, the implementation and the national norms. So you get to a situation where there's such a diversity uh, and mixed up set of norms uh, that it's very difficult to uh, work out which is most appropriate. 
it would be good if the two regional organizations could, as they're planning to do and have been promising to do for the last five years, uh, could harmonize their regulations and then get down to the nitty-gritty of coming up with regulations uh, and standards uh, which could then be evaluated. I, I suppose it would be possible to evaluate across the different standards that are in practice being used between the different countries. Uh, we didn't do that, and uh, we just I, pers I particularly was only gathering information for the two Francophone countries, and I believe that differed from the information that was being collected by my colleagues uh, in the Ghana and Nigeria. So I'm afraid that's a bit of a uh, no. Uh, we don't have any information really at the moment. Julie, I think it's an interesting question. I think if you look at the trade of livestock going out of um, northern eastern Africa, so your Somali, Sudan, and Ethiopia, where that livestock is moving down on hoof and being shipped out live into the Gulf states, I think it's very relevant. Their standards are, you know, you need to meet their standards since it's their big market. I think there's potential then for, you know, Kenya as it grows its meat industry to also target that market. And being able to have an external market that you can supply initially allows us to then have the volume of meat in country as the urban population's economic growth grows as well. And then the standards come into line, you know, maybe the standards are then going to be higher for the East African trade, and so that keeps the commodity in East Africa rather than necessarily going to, to, going to the Gulf. It's something that needs to evolve. I think standards should not necessarily go to the very, the, the very tightest standards straight off. It's very hard to take somewhere like Kenya, where we're looking at maize between 0 and 10, 10 and 20, 20 and 50, and I've got maize at 500 and 1,000. Now, that definitely needs to be removed from the market. But as Daniel was saying earlier on, the flexibility in the standard that would allow different areas for it to go into, so at 300 parts it can go into beef fattening, we need those standards to be a little more flexible than they are at the moment. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, Sophie. And we have reached our official end time. Uh, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our three presenters for uh, being so on the ball with the questions as we're sending them around. Uh, so thank you very much to Sophie, Andy, and Daniel uh, for your excellent contributions and presentations. An even bigger thank you pleasure. to our attendees. Uh, you are the reason that we hold these webinars. Uh, we appreciate your contributions in the chat box, your questions. And uh, we hope we got to uh, the bulk of those that were in the chat box today. I'd like to remind everyone that by virtue of uh, registering for and attending the webinar today, you will get an email uh, in the near future, which will contain uh, the recording of this webinar, as well as a variety of post-event resources, which will include all three of the uh, SPS and trade constraint reports that Leo has been putting out, the East, West, and Southern Africa reports. Um, the West and Southern are in the final stages of approval, so those will be ready very shortly, and we'll make sure that you have those in hand in your email. They'll also be posted on AgriLinks um, in our library and on the event page for this webinar today. I'd like to ex also extend a thank you to the Feed the Future KDAB project, who always does an amazing job of making sure that these webinars go off smoothly. So thank you very much to our team uh, with KDAB. With that, we really appreciate your attendance. Uh, we always appreciate your comments. Uh, you're welcome to email me or email uh, AgroLinks with further comments. And we hope to see you at future AgroLinks webinars. Thank you very much. <laughs>